everyone, I just got back from GDEX, and it was a whirlwind of a weekend. For those of you who don't know, GDEX is a gaming event in the Midwest designed for gamers and game developers. It was my first time attending since I couldn't go last year, but I will surely be going again in the future. I would highly recommend giving it a whirl if you're interested in game development, playing new and upcoming games, or really just have your hand in games in any way, shape, or form. While I was there, I gave a variety of talks, and in one of them, I had the pleasure of joining Ellen Torrey, Damon Hatfield, and Lord Minion 777 to talk about online content creation. I recommend you check out all these creators, as they are really amazing people. You can find links to their channels in the description below. I know a lot of you would have loved to attend this panel, but I also know that isn't always possible. While it isn't the same, I definitely want to capture it for all of you. If you've ever thought about creating content online, I hope this panel both inspires and informs you of the journey that awaits you. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy. We're gonna keep this very casual, free form. Uh, we, the uh, organizers of GDEX, heard that you guys had a lot of interest in content creation and questions, so we wanna spend as much time as we can just answering your questions uh, during our time here. But why don't we start uh, by just sort of like introducing ourselves and telling us a little bit about exactly what you do and how you got into it. Okay, I'm gonna jack your mic. Yeah, I get, we gotta share mic. That's we'll, fine. We'll share. We'll, we'll, we'll share. I feel like it's picking us up anyway, <laughs> but go right ahead. <laughs> um, so I am um, Swanky Box. I do a lot of analytical gaming content from game theories to nostalgia focused pieces, and I have some motivational aspects of the channel. Um, I've been doing YouTube full time for about a year and a half now. Um, and uh, a lot of my stuff that I make is very theory focused. So anyone who watches Matt Patter, the game theorist, who is actually, he's originally from Ohio, Northern Ohio. Um, a lot of my content is very in a similar vein to that. Um, but then I tie into um, some other things where I have a series called Pixel Portals, where I actually go to a lot of environments and games that were important to me growing up, because I always had this crazy sense of travel, but I couldn't do anything because I lived in the middle of like cornfields. <laughs> um, so like, in, so environments, environments and games to me, like that was, that was my escape. If I wanted to go to the beach, I went to Super Mario Sunshine mm -hmm. and I would chill on the beach. That was my way of living vicariously until I could actually see these places later in life. So it's a little bit about, about my channel. I'll slide this back over to Mr. Wade. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm whatever. I'm Wade, one minute seven seven seven. I've been doing YouTube for like thirty years or something. Uh, four years. It was actually like November 6th of 2012, I posted my first video. Um, but for a lot of you that know me, know that I started uh, with my friend Mark, Mark Applier. He, you might have heard of him. Uh, <laughs> he started posting videos, I think, March 2012. Uh, he and I met at a party, and his channel got, his first channel got shut down for some reason, ad related or something. And uh, he was actually thinking about not doing YouTube anymore. And he and I started talking, and I was like, You seem like you're enjoying it. People like you. Maybe you'll be successful. I don't know. Do it. And uh, as you can tell, it worked out for him. But uh, we started doing charity work and stuff together, and I got really into that. And for some reason, people started finding my random Lord Minion channel and subscribing to it. And then I felt compelled to post videos there, and here we are today. So I'm so sorry. Uh, You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I can't say I'm really good at anything that I do, but I do it, and people watch it. And I think they watch it because it's like, you know, if Wade can suck at this, I can suck at this too. Yeah. But, yeah, that's all there really is to it. There's, uh, you guys can ask questions later, but that's all I do. I play games. I don't even edit them anymore. I'm really a bum, so. <laughs> Professional bum. Live the dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, um, I'm Katie. Online at Militari. I am not, I'm more on the Twitch side of streaming than YouTube. I live stream art, and I'm partnered with Twitch, and people show up to watch me draw stuff, and Yay. me try to tell stories and be funny. I don't know. People still come, so it must not be that bad. <laughs> you know the game Drawful? I think that was written about my art skills. <laughs> <laughs> I did, actually. Um, so yeah, that's... I am yeah, one of the concept artists for multivarious games here. Well, I am the concept artist for MVG, and I'm online everywhere. So. It looks cool. You guys should check it out. <laughs> well, it's cool. You, go, you know, you, all three of you have uh, very different approaches to uh, the content that you're creating into live streaming. Do you think that's actually an important thing to do to try and diversify and set yourself apart from the rest of everyone else who's online making YouTube videos? Does anyone want to take that? <laughs> I mean, I can if you want. Free for all. <laughs> do you want to fight over the mic? <laughs> we can share it. We can share it. Okay. Just lean in real close and we'll <laughs> sing a duet. Yeah. Get hot in here. Oh, 
Like, uh, have you guys ever seen Walk Hard? The Let's Duet yeah. song? Yeah, the Dewey Cox story? Let's Duet? No? Maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I misheard that. I hope I did anyway. Um, so, so in terms of uh, differentiating yourself, I think it's very important. Like, I think when you start off, you always have your aspirations and you have the people you look up to. You know, you have that, you know, Markiplier. A lot of, Markiplier is very inspirational to a lot of people because he was very real. I mean, uh, He's very he most. He used to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, like so, you have these role models, and obviously, you want to take after the role models. Um, the only problem with that is you have to also differentiate yourself because there is already a Markiplier. Even though you want to be the next Markiplier or the next Let's Player or the next Theorist or whatever you want to do, um, you got to remember that at your heart, you are your own individual. So mimicking someone else may work for a little while, but like. You have to be true to yourself, um, and you really have to find what makes it work for you. Um, and you will find success if you stick to you know stick to your guts. But but really, you need to fine tune it so that it is different. Like, there's something unique about everyone in this room, and that's really what you you have to bring your uniqueness to it because you're every, all unique and beautiful. Snowflakes. Yes, exactly. Um, and Snowflakes you, melt. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> That's only so they can be frozen into really cool ice sculptures, though. So just you must all melt. <laughs> you must all melt into one sculpture. <laughs> Big Brother is here. <laughs> I'm motivational today. <laughs> so it's probably good that the mics are facing me. So, so yeah, just like always remember that. Like always remember, like don't ever give yourself up to become someone else that you're really not, because in the end, that's going to turn around and bite you in the butt, because you're going to change as a person and not in the ways you want to. You know, people will want to watch you because they, they will grow to like you as a person. Um, and that's always important. Just you gotta stay true to yourself. You gotta be yourself and always remember why you started making content in the first place. Yeah, uh, to piggyback, I would say starting off on YouTube. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah. uh, starting off on YouTube, I remember being a part of a series called Drunk Minecraft, some of you may watch with Mark, um, it was very easy to open up because we were slightly intoxicated whenever we'd record. And uh, I launched my first channel, I'd already done probably 20 episodes of that, 10, 20 episodes of that, and the first couple videos I posted, Molly even reached out to me, uh, my fiance Molly is over here. I'm still right here. <laughs> just kidding. I didn't sleep well apparently, I'm just like sassy today. Um, but I posted my first probably 100 videos and she's like, you're not being yourself. I was like, what do you mean I'm not being myself? I'm doing everything I can for these videos. And now that I look back, I'm, she was absolutely right. Whenever you first start posting content, you're probably not going to be comfortable because you're very out of your element. It's like giving a speech in front of a class. Like teachers, after a certain number of years, get comfortable in front of their students because they've done it so much. Content creators, I mean, you just get to a point where it's like, you quit caring almost. Like, it's like, you know, these are my fans. These are my friends. They know me. I could be lazy today. I've got messed up hair, whatever. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, thank you. But, you know, when you first start off, you're just very nervous. I was very nervous. I can't speak for everybody, but I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I was by myself. I didn't have anybody to bounce off of. I couldn't just make fun of my friend who wasn't there. I mean, I could have been, hey, Mr. Puppet Pal. <laughs> hey, Mr. Puppet Pal, you smell. <laughs> but... I didn't think about that when I first started doing videos, so I was sitting here, hey everybody, uh, I'm Wade, um, I'm going to be playing Settlers of Catan today, and, and you know, I was trying my best to be there, but I just wasn't fully comfortable, and I think over time, you have to develop, it's not something you can force, you can't say, hey, I'm going to be me today, or hey, I'm going to be Mark today, or hey, I'm, you've got to just give yourself a chance to figure out who you are when that camera and the microphone start rolling. Because it is important to be yourself and separate yourself from the others, but you can't force that. That's something that you just have to learn to be comfortable being yourself. And that sounds cheesy, but it's very true. Every successful YouTuber I know has over time developed themselves. They don't put on a facade or personality, that is them. So yes, Mark is always like that. Jack is always that loud. <laughs> and Bob is always that person you're like, no, Bob would never do that. And then he betrays you. <laughs> they are really like that. But we, we've just become comfortable being ourselves in front of that camera. You watch it. <laughs> uh, but it's something that takes a long time. And you can't just say, hey, I need to be this. You need to figure out what this is that you are. 
And once you figure that out and you're comfortable in front of the camera, that's when you start to flourish because people are comfortable seeing you being comfortable. It's like whenever you see someone out having a good time and laughing, you want to talk to that person. You want to be friends with that person. But if you see somebody out there like, <laughs> you're like, okay, whatever, get out of here. Yes. You heard that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, putting on the facade, like the cocky, the chicken, half chicken dance. I'm trying here, okay? <laughs> I don't know if I could add it. I mean, my streaming is so much different because I don't actually record and post videos to YouTube. All of my streaming is done live, and I don't even show my face. I just draw, and people come and watch me draw and talk to me live. So for Do me, you talk? Yeah. So I read chat and draw at the same time and actively talk. And it's a lot of work, but like you, you kind of have to be yourself. You multitasking too hard to not be yourself. But um, yeah, people gravitate towards people with really open and genuine personalities. So if you're trying to stream, just treat them like friends, kind of, and people will be attracted to that. And that includes, you know, like, normal friendship stuff. Like, don't just walk up in a bathrobe and nothing else and start drawing on stream. <laughs> like, you know, if you're going to see your friends, usually you put on pants, which... Hey, guys, put on pants today. Thank you. Now, if you're streaming or recording, it's different. But if you're showing, if you're like a live-action skit, you, you know, whatever. Although a pantsless stream could be your angle. I think, well, I think Twitch, Twitch is pretty strict like about that kind of stuff. <laughs> they changed the rules. <laughs> uh, Things have changed since uh, Justin TV. Yeah. So if someone's going someone's gonna to make their first video or do their first stream, what would, you, what would be the most important piece of advice you'd give them? The one thing. The Test one piece your advice. equipment before you tell everybody when your stream is. <laughs> My first stream was actually on live stream a year ago, and nothing worked, and I had like people sitting around just waiting. But I already had like an audience on Tumblr, so there were people actually waiting. It was a disaster. Um, a clever so, thing that I don't do when I've streamed, I've not streamed like a year, I used to stream a lot more, but some people have a second Twitch account where they don't have any followers, and they test their stuff on that, and that then they do like, yeah, I don't do it, because I'm lazy, but it would be smart if I did it. <laughs> so a piece of advice out there that I don't follow. How about you, Brad? Um, so it was <laughs> first video, like, just yeah. what, what you would do? So like, the one thing. It's interesting because, you know, from... The difference you're gonna encounter between YouTube and Twitch, obviously, is a live element to it. I'll be honest; I do my all my stuff is produced and then put online, so I don't have the you know the extra anxiety of clicking out, you know, pressing the button and knowing I'm live and then hoping everything goes right. Um, so with YouTube videos, it's when I first started, um, I took it slow because I could keep you know for me, I, I I wanted to put time and I wanted my my videos to really resonate with me, but I was not comfortable portraying myself in the videos. I mean, I, I come from a video background behind the camera, but not being in front of the camera. Um, so for me, starting off and taking that time and really figuring out what these few first videos are going to be, that was kind of very important because also at that point I didn't know what my channel was going to be. When I started doing YouTube, I was doing skits. I was doing like like funny things because I thought that's what I wanted to do. And then and it changed. It changed because I realized that they required multiple people. Those people couldn't always commit. Um, so while taking it slow at the start, I also that gave me the time to really figure out the direction I wanted to take my channel. Um, so for those first couple of videos. Um, know that you are going to put something out and no one's going to watch it. Now that sounds really depressing, but at the same time, you have to think about your viewer's point of view. Plus, you're working against the almighty YouTube God <laughs> that's not gonna stir up your content to anyone. So like, the important thing is you do not get discouraged even though you're, you know, you're uploading these things, you gotta keep at it. Um, because there will be a time when you do accrue a certain amount of videos that you will, you know, people will find yourself or you will have that breakthrough. You never know when that breakthrough is going to come. So you always got to push forward. So going, you know, when you start off and you go into that mindset, like always keep that mindset, regardless of how hard it gets, regardless of how bad those first videos are, like always know that with each video you put out, you get better. So I guess the best advice I can give is take your time with those first videos but do not let those first videos discourage you from, from going forward because you will grow. And with YouTube as opposed to Twitch, there's um, the backlog element. So if you post a video on YouTube, 
people 10 years from then, 10 years from now, 10 years from when you posted it, will go back and find it. So a lot of our, most views, even on my channel, are backlog views. So a new video will get X amount of views, whatever, from your audience. But then people go back and watch your old stuff too. Like, oh, hey, I like this. Did this guy play this game? Yeah, he did. Let's go watch that. So even if you post a video today that doesn't do that well, that might be your most popular video in four or five years. You don't know. So whenever you do post those videos, one, make sure that that's what you want on your channel because that's out there. Once you put yourself out there, it's out there. If you're wearing a dress and singing and drinking wine out of a fish, that's what people are going to know you for, the guy who drinks wine out of fish. <laughs> no, I don't know what that even means, to be honest, but it's what came to mind. Uh, but... <laughs> But the, the audience thing is very important. He brought up not worrying about who's watching right now or how many people are watching. That, that's always going to be something. There's only one person on YouTube who's at the top. Everyone else will always see somebody else getting more views than them or more subscribers than them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's always a bigger fish. If you say, man, if only I could get 10 views a day, I'd be so happy. When you get to 10 views a day, it'll be 50 views a day. When you get to 50, it'll be 100, 1,000, 100,000, whatever it may be. You're never going to be satisfied if you worry about numbers like that. You're always going to be wishing you had more. You'll always see this person getting that many or this person growing faster than you. It doesn't matter if you passed this person with zero subscribers today. You're going to want to pass the person with a thousand subscribers tomorrow. You just have to enjoy what you do. Uh, you, we all get into funks periods of time where we're like, man, why is no one watching this particular video? I thought this was great. Why is no one enjoying it? That, that happens to all of us, but you have to take a step back and just be like, okay, listen, I'm having fun with what I do. People are coming. I'm still growing. I'm not losing subscribers, thankfully. You know, I'm still gaining one or two a day or a thousand a day or 10,000, whatever it may be, wherever, whatever size you are. And as long as you're enjoying what you do and people can see that, they're going to flock to you. So don't worry about how fast you grow, whether you grow really quickly and then slope back down. I mean, my chart's like a heartbeat. You never know what you're going to see. Some people's charts are exponential like that and some people steady, steady, steady. Some people take three or four years. Uh, my friend Patrick. He was doing YouTube basically as long as I was, and he wasn't getting the uh, growth as fast because he just didn't get that viral video that got lots of views. And all of a sudden, he started taking off recently. You just never know when you're going to get that lucky break. And that's one thing about YouTube and Twitch is that sometimes it takes a lucky break. You've got to be drawing something that people want to see that day. If you're drawing Overwatch, and you're the only one drawing Overwatch, and Overwatch is booming, people might flock to you and watch you draw Mercy or Reinhardt or something. Uh, if you're doing a game theory video and... Uh, Shout out to here, Matt Pat, a little bit, but you know, you start that, you do a FNAF theory, and all of a sudden that's 30 million views, whereas you were getting 10,000 views before. Uh, for me, Rust, Seven Days to Die, Dead by Daylight, something like that might take off and get you a lot of viewership. But you might not get that lucky break till three or four years in. You don't jump onto the YouTube train hoping to become a millionaire tomorrow or getting a million subscribers in a day. It's a process. You've got channels like Jack or Mark or PewDiePie that, you know, take off. They're very, very talented people, very dedicated. They get lots of those lucky breaks early on and all of a sudden they're one of the biggest in the world. And you've got people that grow very steadily and very slowly. So if you go into it wanting numbers and money and fame and fortune, you're probably not going to get there because you're going to get discouraged because you're not growing fast enough. But if you go in there with a passion about what you're doing, people will see that. If you go in there and you're enjoying your let's plays or you're enjoying your drawing or you're enjoying cooking or whatever it is you go in there with a passion with, eventually people will find that and they'll want to see what you're doing. Now, occasionally, people on the internet can be mean. Huh? Yeah, hey, sometimes. What? <laughs> Who told you? It's true. <laughs> when did that happen? Yeah, it's a new thing. It's a new thing the internet's trying. What would be your advice for uh, dealing with jerks, negative feedback, mean comments? You That's guys... when you've made it. <laughs> When someone, That's how you know you've made it. Yeah, I mean, if someone's going out of their way to dislike your video, like, I'll post a video, and within three seconds, it's got one or two dislikes, before anyone's even had a chance to watch the opening, yeah. hello, and it's like, you know, that's three free views I got right there. <laughs> or people come in there like, you're never going to be Markiplier, or you're never going to be able to draw, like, so it's like, people do that, but it's, you got to think, what's their motivation for this? Probably jealousy. What else would bring someone to be like, go out of their way to be negative? They're jealous of either something you got, something you got going, the talent you have, or they're just not really worth your time. So I, I actually have an interesting, interesting story about that. So the thing is, like, that's very important. You have to also think about, like, you know, too often when you grow, people, you know, they see that subscriber count, like, oh my gosh, I hit a hundred thousand subscribers, I hit a million subscribers. Those are all people. Like, this is not just a number. Like, yeah. each and one of those people have their own lives, their own story. Like. That's the biggest thing I took from it was I really dove into like when people leave me in comments, I ask them why. 
I was like, well, what's your thoughts on this? And even if they respond negatively, again, that's totally fine because I always want to treat them as if they're peers. Like, to me, it's all about having that discussion about whatever that topic is. Regardless if they disagree, they hate my video, they think I'm stupid, like, that's totally fine, that's their opinion. But the most important thing is knowing that they may be coming from a background that's completely different from you. You don't know if they're that kid who doesn't have a good life in school, who you know, comes home and like their outlet is posting mean stuff online, which you think would be weird because if they're having a rough time in school, why would they come home and do the same thing to people online? But it's actually a form of sort of coping with that. You know, they, they, they do what is done to them. Um, and I had, when I first started and I first had my first successful video, some guy commented on my video and it's like, basically, <laughs> You know, the standard stuff. He went through the YouTube mean stuff. Oh, drink bleach and do all these things. And I was like, okay, well, I have the Clorox right here. But, <laughs> but I really, I really don't listen him. to the comments. Yeah, yeah, don't listen. <laughs> but I asked him, I was like, you know, I, I, I was like, hey, I, I agree with, you know, if this is your opinion, that's totally fine. But I don't think your vileness in these things are, is really, it's really mooting your point. It's not making your point valid because you're spitting so much vile that, whatever you're trying to prove is getting lost in the sea of insults. And what ended up happening after a couple exchanges, the dude just broke down. And he wrote me this huge apology. And he's like, I have a rough time at home. I, I, it's, it, was, it was really sad. Cause like, I, I, he wanted someone to watch his videos. And he's like, I have no one to talk to you. I have no friends. I have a rough life at home. And, you know, and he's like, I just want someone to watch my videos. And so I went to his, his channel and I watched his videos and like, I kind of felt liberating. Like I was the first person to leave an honest comment on this channel. And like that going the full ex journey from hater to finding peace with that person was, was changed my perspective on anything. Now, anytime leaves, someone leaves a hateful comment, I like, I dive into it. Cause I was like, there's gotta be a reason. Like, and like you said, it could be jealousy. It could be, it could be a lot of things. Like, you know, and also people, you know, unfortunately some people we have, different disorders and stuff that we're born with and we can't control and all these things factor into our online personalities and this stuff comes out and like you always got to be understanding regardless if someone's super vile you have to you have to be kind and i think that's the most important thing is to be kind i think understanding ignoring deleting are your main options you don't yeah. want to return hate with hate Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't want to be that person someone either looks up to and they're had a bad day so they're mean to and then you go and berate there's nothing worse than having someone you look up to put you down or even someone that you know you might be mean to but somewhat respect you, know, you just don't want to do that you don't want to be that person doesn't matter if you've got two subscribers like one of the, my coolest moments there was a YouTuber I watched all the time uh, I think he has 2,000 subscribers right now and uh, he messaged me on Twitter one day and he's like hey I heard you uh, gave me a shout out the other day that's really cool of you and I was like well I watched your stuff and I liked it. So, I mean, you didn't ask me for anything, but oh my God, he's reaching out to me. I had like 500,000 subscribers at the time, which doesn't mean anything to me as far as like, I don't feel like I'm better than anybody at that. But for him to reach out, I, I was fanboying over this guy. And that just shows you the way I ideally would like to see YouTube and Twitch work is it's like, you know, you don't have to kiss my hand. I'm not the godfather because I hit 100,000 subscribers or a million subscribers, whatever else. I'm still just Wade. I'm just dumber now than I used to be. <laughs> I have less of an attention span. Like, oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, Do you like them dank memes? I still don't fully understand. Like, Molly makes fun of me for my lack of meme understanding. She tells me I should look at knowyourmeme.com more often. So I'll ask her questions like, you know that meme with the guy who's like, and she's like, just go to this website, find it. I don't feel like dealing with, your, with you right now. So I, I was very internet stupid before I started YouTube. I was like a pre-law student and I could do math and argue in front of courts and stuff, but now I'm, I don't know, I can't do anything. So that's basically what I do for a living, nothing. So what, uh, in terms of like, cause I don't stream and like, obviously you do art, like what kind of the same things for you? Yeah, the live action hate is a different world. <laughs> different world, I have no Comments easy, but whatever someone's being vile in your streams, there's only so many things you can do. Trolls in streams, I personally enjoy because I like trolling people back. Um, but when dealing with hate, like people in Twitch will drop in. A lot of people on Twitch, for creative streamers in particular, will get angry because if you're a partnered creative streamer, which um, I am, but people trying to get partnered on the gaming side of Twitch will mm -hmm. be very angry over that. So they'll come in like, ha, oh, you can't draw this looks like crap. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. I wonder so, why they can't get partnered. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, maybe you're a little nicer. So um, I'll usually troll them back for a little bit, but then block them. Um, and I think the biggest thing is, 
if you get popular enough, there will always be people working against you. It could be jealousy, it could be just you stood out and they're having a bad day, so you're their target. Like, it's hard to know why. Bottom line is, you should never return hate with hate. Like, I don't care how angry they make you, just block exist, just block them and ignore them. If you feel like you need to talk back with them to like see if they're just doing okay, make sure you do it in a very professional manner. You are still, you have a presence online and people will be watching that, especially if you are really popular. If people are throwing hate at you, people will watch you just to see how you respond to that hate. So you kind of have um, that to keep in mind. Um, I personally harness the hate as motivation and turn it into spite and that's how I draw. <clears throat> <laughs> it is It is very good fuel. <laughs> Another good reason to avoid giving the hate back is there exists channels and streams out there that thrive on drama, and you don't want to be there. Yeah. Today in the news. <laughs> we don't speak the name, but... <laughs> All the lights dim as like, his yeah. presence is here. He or she who must not be named. <laughs> you say it three times, it'll appear like Rumpelstiltskin. Uh, but yeah, you just want to be careful with that. I've actually I forget who it was. I've got a I forget I've got a friend who streamed and they did the same thing you did. They trolled back. And actually one of their best friends now is a person that used to troll them really hard. But when they started trolling person. back, they like like that became a thing that they did. The person would come and just be mean, the other person would be mean back, and then they start laughing and they became friends from that somehow. I actually have two people like that in my streams. Yeah. They came in and they were screaming at me, so I started like not screaming, being really mad. So I started being mean back and then it went to like homestuck territory and now they're friends. <laughs> so. You okay? No. All right. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. It's not like and you like were underwater and you found air for the first time in minutes. <laughs> Do you guys have questions for the panel? Yeah, right here. Yeah, I, I, I you guys all seem to do very different things like live streaming, live play YouTube, and prepare YouTube. I was just wondering, like, what is your different kind of preparation, time frame, and rituals before you record? <clears throat> So I'll speak real quickly from the gaming perspective. I stream, I'm gonna to try to get back into streaming. Uh, I think Twitch is a good supplement to uh, gaming on YouTube. It's good to do both, but it's hard. I do two videos a day, seven days a week. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to be able to hire an editor uh, last year. So I don't edit my own content anymore, but I did edit like my first 900 videos. I would record edit myself. Uh, the first couple hundred I was doing that while working a full-time job too. And it's tough, it depends on the video, right? So if you do a horror game where there's a lot of suspense, you don't wanna break that atmosphere. The atmosphere is the most important thing in a horror game. So for those, there's not a whole lot of cutting. So you record for 20, 30 minutes, you sync everything up, you cut the end, cut the beginning. Uh, if you have an intro or outro, you put those on there, you make sure that your audio sounds good. If you wanna add a couple effects in, that's fine. Uh, but then you do a survival series like a Rust or a Seven Days to Die where there's a lot of grinding, a lot of harvesting materials that gets really dull. So you might record for two or three hours to get a 15 minute video on that. So it really depends on the game when it comes to gameplay. Um, I'm sure the, you do probably a lot more editing than I ever did. Um, <laughs> but for games it's usually a lot easier than something like a theory video because I don't have to do much other than play the game and then cut out the dull parts, add in some other effects. I would say the longest I probably ever spent, well, compilations are a different story. I think I spent 24 hours of actual working time, the first compilation I ever worked on. A normal gaming video might be anywhere from 15 minutes of editing to two or three hours of editing. It really just depends on what you're editing and how long it is and what you're trying to accomplish with that particular video. Do you want to go next? Yes, I'll go. Yeah, okay. Like I said, it's a little different with live streaming art, because art in general will take several hours. Like a piece alone can take three to four hours. So it's not uncommon for me to stream anywhere between four to eight or 10 hours. People drop into the Twitch stream and be like, how long have you been streaming? And we'll like get seven hours and it blows their minds. I'm just like, anyway. Um, but before a stream, for me personally, you have to kind of get in like the right mindset because it is live. I, since drawing does take so long, I have to actively be talking to chat and engaging with people at the same time. And you have to be I'm happy to do that. <laughs> so it's good to like come out, um, off of, get off of work and then like um, eat dinner, like maybe read something, just like calm down and then have your art ready to go, start up stream. And then for the next several hours, your attention should be on like your chat. Like they're taking their time to watch you. So I make sure like everybody's happy. Um, I do some video editing. Um, I actually do have a YouTube. I should be putting speed paints on it, but I just, I don't have free time. But um, for that, it's taking the five hours of art and condensing it into 15 minutes of educational speed paint, which can take hours. So I don't do that as much. 
They're very different animals, uh, streaming and YouTube. Yeah. Streaming really requires you to be on point with what you're saying because, you know, you're live. If you slip up and say the wrong thing, it's out there and there's no cutting it out. Mm -hmm. Whereas YouTube, it's a lot more time investment after the fact. If you screw up during, it's like, okay, I said my intro wrong, I'll just say it again. Or then I'll probably leave in the bad one anyway because I'm an idiot like that. <laughs> but, you know, you have that option to, you know, it's, you, you commit for half an hour to a recording, whereas streaming, usually you go for several hours and you've got to be on point that whole few hours. Your world is something alien to me, so, so please, I want to hear I this come, too. I come from a background of actual, you know, I, video production for like ad agencies and stuff like that. So I did video professionally for a living, whether I was dangling up above pits of molten lava, trying, or not lava, metal, <laughs> trying to get like, I used to do the, the craziest stuff. Like I would make these videos of like giant mechanical arms, like building like these and stuff from like, Animations for like hospitals and, and things like that. What so kind of hospital has molten lava? No, no, no. <laughs> those, 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 those are two, two separate industries. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so, but like, it's the same process. So, like, when we would make videos there, I wanted to take that process and take that level of quality and put it in my videos. So, like, I make weekly videos, but they are, you know, animated. They are, I go out and get footage. Like, they're basically all like mini documentaries. Um, and the reason for that is, I don't like the direction that YouTube's going for content. Uh, it's, it's very uh, cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Personality stuff, awesome. However, toxicity, drama, yeah. cheap video, like all these things is like the reason why YouTube keeps getting, you know, tightening the, the YouTube algorithm and forcing people to like kill themselves over making content is because advertisers are pulling them, their dollars away from YouTube because they don't want their stuff on this toxic content. So with that in mind, I, you know, I want to, regardless of how many views my stuff gets, I always try to put my heart and soul into it. And that starts with, you know, researching the idea. Or, or if it's based off of something I know, just diving back into that moment from my childhood where I, that's, you know, the, where those memories lie. Revisiting that level in that game, walking around it, and trying to remember the things. And you'll be surprised what you remember by going back to old places. And all that stuff makes it into the script. From there, from the script, you do the voiceover. I use this handy dandy Blue Yeti. Um, Record the voiceover, edit the voiceover, then you have the actual production. So for me, I don't do any on-camera stuff. Very rarely do I. I might start doing it in the future, but that makes things more difficult because that means you have to have footage and animations and graphics made for every part that you would normally be on camera. Um, and my videos range from 13 minutes to 22 minutes. I just put out a Five Nights at Freddy's video yesterday about sister location that is 22 minutes long. The first 14 minutes is it, it really, I mean, I spent a lot of time producing it. Um, and then the, the second half is actually rebuttal to that same idea because I, in theory, is I feel like the rebuttal and the discussion afterwards is just as important. I don't want to be the one source of information for that. All of this is a standard video timeline for where you're making these things. So then you have all the, all the graphics, all the stuff you put in there. Now you're like, okay, now I gotta balance my audio levels. Make sure that like, when someone's watching my video, I'm not like, hey guys. Like, <laughs> like, that's a big thing. Like, you don't want people to click onto your video and then you're like screaming and peaking levels because you don't, so you have to balance your audio levels. Um, tying music into that and finding the balance between that is difficult because people use you know, noise canceling headphones. They use speakers. They use cheap earbuds. That's like, a call for live streaming. It's too. yeah, it's balancing music. It's so crazy. And, and like, and then on top of that, you have rendering. So you, you know, rendering that takes time. When you have graphics and stuff incorporating your videos, and then like with this Five Nights at Freddy's video that I did, it's rendering, and then it, it's like, oh, unknown compiling error. It's like, okay, thank you. Let's see the details. <laughs> let's, let's see the details on this. We don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. like, so then, so then you have to figure, you have to troubleshoot. Like troubleshooting, you got to, and if you're working on the clock, knowing that if I don't get this video out by this time, then my youth, my channel is going to suffer viewership. All of this is taken into consideration for that timeline. That's why I only do one video a week. And even for the stuff I do, I'm only able to do it because I've been doing this for years, and I edit like a Wolverine. Like I'm just, I take two razors. I'm like, like it's. I, I just, I have so much experience with it. I just edit so fast. Like, I mean, that's used to be my job. I used to crank out animations every two weeks for, you know, all these different industries and stuff. Um, so my stuff is on the extreme end of things. Like it's really well-produced stuff that you would actually see maybe even more appropriate for like a screening 
like in a, in a theater or something versus actually online medium. But I always want to go back to that and have this stuff be sort of a benchmark for what YouTube can be. So while you have, and it's and not saying that anything that they do is, no, I'm not saying this stuff is cheap. All of this. Oh, is, it's cheap. It's, <laughs> it's totally cheap. All of it takes a different skill set. Like me on camera, I, I, no. Like it's like one of those things where I, I could do it, but like harnessing that personality and being comfortable is also just as difficult as honing these editing skills. Like all of these things, they're all skills. They can all be taught and learned and they all take time to develop. And like that is why like it goes back to that uniqueness factor, what you're going to do, why, you know, how you're going to differentiate yourself because you can be successful by any of these things. And you do games, you do game scoops and you work for IGN, you yeah, do all this like, cool stuff. Yeah. Like, like I represent kind of the other end of the spectrum where I work for a big, you know, gaming media company. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm actually going to be giving a talk uh, a little bit later today at 5 p.m. in the National Ge Geographic Theater. So I can talk a little bit more about from the, the big uh, corporate. Yeah, yeah. Angle of things. Because so. actually, also, that's where I came from. Big corporate America, working for giant software companies, the Googles of the Midwest, and things like that. And like, that's why jumping ship to YouTube was like, oh, hey guys, I'm here by myself, trying to figure it all out. Um, but, I like um, the negative stigma of like, the big corporate companies. <laughs> they're so evil. Well, they're, all of them. You walk into a meeting, everyone has suits on, but they don't have faces. They're all just shadows. <laughs> <laughs> they're wearing those masks from like the purge, yeah. just yeah. sitting around a desk. Yeah. Who gets it today? <laughs> <laughs> they have a big roulette wheel, they just spin it, and it's like... We have uh, ten minutes left here. Who has another question? Right here? Uh, oh, we'll get to you. Let's do this lady first. So, I think a lot of things that a lot of content creators struggle with is sort of balancing a full-time job with making content enough to the point where you can make the leap to do what you want to do full-time to actually make money from it so you don't have to start to death. So for you guys personally, how could you, first of all, make time while you're doing your full-time job to do this? And then how did you make that leap? Like what kind of courage did you find to be like, yes, I can do this now? What was that process like? I sold drugs. <laughs> Joke, joking. <laughs> so after the... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it was really difficult. Uh, I worked a part-time job when I first started doing YouTube. And I was only... I, I was only working like 20, 30 hours a week, so it was a little bit more manageable. Um, but really, you just have to balance how much you can do. Like, I do two videos a day, seven days a week. But if I was working a full-time job, I doubt I could do it that way. Um, you find, I guess, your best days, best times. You say, hey, I'm going to post three videos a week. Maybe I'll do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Or maybe I'll do Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Maybe I do Monday through Friday. I take the weekend off. And the weekend, I make content that I release throughout the week. You do something like that. Uh, you just try to find, and it depends on what kind of videos you're doing, too. If you're doing a video like he's doing, you might do one video a month. If you don't have a music video, you might do one video every six months, something like that. Um, but it really, to me, depends on what you're able to do. I tried doing one to two videos a day when I was working a full-time job, and I would come home, uh, eat dinner, and I'd pass out. And I'm, I'm a person that can't fall asleep easily, but I was getting two to three hours of sleep uh, a night, and after a month or two of doing that, I was dying. <laughs> it, was, it was painful, it was rough because I was editing my own content at the time because you know when you're first starting off, you have to do it all yourself, and I was, by far not an expert, not that I am now, but learning to edit, it would take me a long time. I didn't know how to use the program I was using, so I was trying to learn, eat dinner, see people that existed in my life at one point, and uh, make content at the same time. And uh, when I hit, man, 30, 40, 50,000 subscribers, somewhere in that range, it was November, December of, uh, I think, 2013, and I was like, man, my channel's doing well. I'm gonna quit my job and go full time. And that's when I learned that December ad revenue is much better than the rest of the year. Because then January through May, it was like, I've got to pay a bill. <laughs> oh. So it was a struggle. It was a really big struggle. I would say do not quit your job during the prime time of the year. I would say October through December are the three best months and the first half of January for making ad revenue on YouTube. And if you make the leap after that, you're going to be struggling for a while. But really, it's what you can manage, what you think you can live on. and do produce what you can when you can don't kill yourself trying to do it because if you're fatigued and not enjoying your life it's going to show up in your content so just a quick segue for that so the reason also why that ad revenue dips after as soon as well as soon as january begins there's a couple of reasons obviously people and people who are in you know, businesses are spending money towards the holidays they want people to buy their products for the holidays there's a lot more spending but another part of that which people don't really know is 
you know, businesses assign their budgets at the beginning of the year. So they're using whatever is left in that budget in December, and then as soon as January and those months roll around, everything's brand new. They have to get those budgets approved so they can actually spend advertising dollars on YouTube. Now, what that causes is like, you don't know when that meeting's gonna take place so that they get the go ahead to run those ads. So January is like a ghost town. Like, you, like it goes from like, you're you know, going up the roller coaster and then you're just, it's already at the bottom. Like there's no even graph going down. It's just like flatlined, you're dead. <laughs> um, it's, but that's I, part of- You're not talking about views though, right? You're just talking no, about revenue. revenue. So I mean, but it's, that's um, in terms of like, like he said, like if he, he saw his channel was doing very well in December, but it's actually, it can be misleading, but that's just everyone pouring the rest of their funds into that remaining year. Um, and kind of to kind of go back to what you had originally asked and how you can actually, when do you make the jump? Because that's always the scary part. And also most people get to the edge and they do not make the jump um, because it is scary and because everything over there is unknown. While there is great freedom in the unknown, there's also more responsibility because everything you do, even as a YouTuber, even as an artist, you are a one-man army. You are your HR person. You are your, from a business standpoint, you basically, nothing moves unless you do it. So you have to wear the hats of everyone who would normally do these things. Um, so you have to study these things. You have to do these, and that's kind of, you have to really pay attention to that stuff when you jump into it. Um, I suggest saving. I mean, a big part of like, my plunge was like, I'm gonna do this for six months. If it doesn't work out, I'm gonna try to find another job. That's the truth of it. Like, I did not know it would work out, I'm glad it did. Um, but it's one of those things where I made sure I saved. I, I put, put aside, I, I did not splurge and buy things. I did not buy games. I did not do a lot of stuff because I saved. And I wanted to cover my expenses for those months so I could at least give it a chance for three months, six months. And then it's like, oh my gosh, it's been two years. Like, and, but that was never my expectation. Like, no, this was ever my expectation. It was a hope, but all about the planning, you know, the aspect of it, like you have to also treat it like a business. I mean, the thing is creating content is fun, but making a living off of creating content is a different, is a different wheelhouse. It's not all, you know, sunshine and glitter and ponies. It's actually like, it's the grind. Was it ever that? <laughs> <laughs> it could be. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is my dream. Not on YouTube. this side of YouTube, <laughs> the dark side of YouTube. Okay, dark you YouTube. don't stream full time. I do not. I the whole uh, working full time, getting three hours of sleep a night, and forgetting you have friends. That's where I'm at now. Um, <laughs> it's all <laughs> downhill. <laughs> I flatlined and around the bottom. Um, realistically, though, I mean, for, for my position, I'm the main, the only concept artist at MVG, so I don't have the option of quitting my full time job. It's not something I want to do right now because I enjoy what I do. But at the same time, the temptation of if I didn't have a full time job, I could probably make full-time streaming online work as an artist. For artists, it's a little different. Um, like, I'm not pushing out YouTube videos that are gonna get thousands of views for ad revenue. But for artists, um, there's like Patreon and stuff. And if you build a large enough audience, you can make several thousand a month with Patreon, which is more than enough to live off of. Um, for that though, you do kind of need to be pushing out content and it would take a full-time <laughs> time commitment. Um, so where I'm at now is kind of, holding back, building up an audience. Um, I'm not really, I don't have enough time to put in online to fully build it up to like a self-sustaining like full-time job yet. But I still have a full-time job. So um, I guess I'm kind of in that turmoil right now is there's a lot of different ways my life could go. I'm just gonna forget sleep exists and try to do all of them at <laughs> once at the same time. <laughs> I think that's an interesting thing too though because she also does something that she enjoys for her job. So like, yeah. There's not, you know, I got burned out in my last job. So like, I wanted to, I wanted to make that jump. I was sprinting towards the edge. Whereas she's like, well, things are good here because she's making cool stuff as a concept artist. So like, you're torn in two directions because there's also safety and stability while doing what she's doing. But there's also a great deal of happiness too because she gets to draw stuff, cool stuff for <laughs> games and stuff and then and see that stuff come to life in games. So like, that's like a, an interesting contrast because depending on where you are and what you're currently doing is also going to make that jump different. It's always different for everyone. It's always going to be a gamble when you take the leap. Um, you might be in the middle of a giant peak, like a, if you hit a big game like a FNAF game when it first came out, people's channels started booming, but then they all kind of settled back down as FNAF. It's still popular, but it's not, you know, all day, every day, anything everyone talks about. So understand where you're at too. If you think that you might be on a peak, 
then just give it some time, see if that peak settles down, because odds are it'll level off a little bit. Channels generally grow at a pretty steady rate, some of them boom, but even if you have a giant peak, it'll kind of come back down and start going up again at a normal rate. So if you look at my analytics, there's a lot of sites you can go to, like Social Blades and things where you can look at the peaks and valleys of your channel. And everybody has their ups and downs, but you kind of get a feel for where you're at, and maybe you get a boom here and a lift, but you're still going to kind of grow at a somewhat steady rate usually. So if you have a great March, see how April does too. Don't just say, I'm throwing away everything and going full time. Um, but it's always going to be a gamble because I think in the back of all of our minds where it's like, hey, when's the other shoe going to drop? When are people going to stop watching? When is this all going to crash and burn? When is YouTube going to go away? It's, it is a gamble because whenever you don't have an employer or someone guaranteeing money, and even those are gambles too in a sense because you can always be fired or that company could go under. Uh, Enron type situations do exist. Uh, but with self-employment, you don't know. You just never know whenever people are going to be like, you know, Wade, I just realized you suck at games. I'm gonna quit watching. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I look at anything, look what happened. To, <laughs> <laughs> look what happened to Vine. Vine. Mm -hmm. Think of all the Vine stars who made yeah. a living off of doing Vine and just hearing the news that their platform is going away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like that's like yeah, that's someone sweeping, you know, taking the rug from out underneath you. What do you do then? And you know, the sucky thing about that is this because you know there are financial backings and reasons of why that went away, but also. People are just stealing their content. People are throwing it on YouTube, making you know, making Uncommon montage reasons. videos. People yeah. freebooting it to Facebook, and Facebook just being like, "Oh, nothing's wrong. I'm just, I'm just give me all this money." Like, it's like yeah. that's what causes the death of this stuff. And like, when your platform dies, like, what do you do? You have to have a backup plan. Like, you have to think about like these different things. Like, what if YouTube's just like, this isn't? I mean, YouTube does not make a lot of money. The the company itself. Think about how much storage it has to constantly expand, all these warehouses, all these data farms, it has to store all these videos. They're spending so much money to maintain all these videos online, and that's why they're squeezing us as content creators to keep producing stuff faster and faster. Like, at some point, like- you Just it's go like, home and, <laughs> okay. Yeah, like at some point we're gonna snap, <laughs> or they're gonna snap, and like, and like, what happens if YouTube's gone? So like, that's another thing is like, by being multi multifaceted and, and really explore these other options. Maybe you're a YouTuber, but you also stream on Twitch. Like having these different things. Pornhub. Porn, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're actually out of time, but I promised someone over here we would answer their question right here, real fast. Um, I'm starting, um, I'm trying to get into art streaming um, and doing commission work, but I don't know how to get my foot in the door. Do you have any advice for that? Oh, that's a very long conversation. I'm not sure. I might talk to you more after the panel. Yeah. But in general, um, use places like Instagram and like Tumblr and Twitter to build up an audience beforehand. Because it's actually, as far as just jumping straight into streaming as an artist, it will help if you've already got an audience that knows your art ready to watch you. Because that's what's going to like push you up to the viewer channels. Um, so try to build your audience elsewhere. Um, if you are streaming, the biggest thing with art streaming is it's really boring to watch someone draw for several hours. Uh, it, it is. Um, so you have to entertain people while you draw. So if you are going to art stream and you want to be successful at it, you need to, it really helps to like get a mic and talk with people and like truly make, you are both an entertainer and an artist and you have to approach it as both and make your stream something people want to watch and be funny and like talk to people. So I could talk with you more afterwards, though, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Real quick, about starting up uh, before we stop. Don't worry about having the best of everything when you start your channel. Um, if you decide to go with a YouTube channel or a Twitch stream, if you invest $10,000 and then decide you don't want to do it after a month, that's $10,000 you'll never get back. If, you know, whatever you put into it, you can't expect you're always going to get back. Because sometimes, like I said, it takes years to build up. So whatever you can afford, whatever you have on hand, uh, if you don't have a webcam but you have a microphone and a computer, there's free programs like your OBSs. Uh, you can probably find free audio recording software for your microphone and stuff like that. Just do what you can do and don't put yourself bankrupt thinking you're going to be a star in a week because it doesn't work like that. So just take your time. People want to see you and as you improve your equipment over time, I'm still trying to figure it all out as far as equipment and stuff goes. So just don't panic about that and build up as you can go. And just one small quick thing. Same thing with that. Like, People also like to see the growth. I mean, knowing you started off with, you know, maybe putting your cell phone on a stand and then like recording everything on your cell phone or something, over time you just grow. But like people always like to go back to your old videos. Like having, showing that growth, I think is something people like because that gives them hope. You know, the, the content creators of tomorrow who are starting today, they will look back at that and be like, 
Markiplier. Markiplier started filming on a potato. <laughs> like, like, what was he using? But like, then you look at it today, it's like, oh my gosh, is that like a red dragon? Like, what is that? Like, that's a really expensive I think he had a Blue Yeti, <laughs> a cheap desktop, and no yeah. webcam, if I remember yeah. right. But like, the thing is like, people like watching that. And because I think it's, it's all about inspiring people too. It's like, you, you see that and you're like, I can do that. Like, it's like, that gives me hope. I don't need all this high-end gear because people liked him for his personality. And then that eventually, you know, as things became more successful and he did have his success, he then took that and then he got this other things. But it doesn't mean you can't create now. You can always create now and don't let that ever stop you from starting. Cool. Guys, thanks so much for coming by today. Thanks to you guys. Thank you guys. You've made it to the end of the video, but wait, your quest isn't over yet. I hope you enjoyed this content creation panel. If you haven't already, please check out the channels of everyone involved in this panel, as they all make really awesome stuff. You can find links in the description below. If you want to check out some more live stuff from the world of Swanky Box, you can also check out these two videos on screen. And thank you again for watching. Cheers.